The cold had been severe and continued so, but the weather was clear and the sun shone. Yet all the way from Mikhailovska, the sight of the road was made horrible by the bodies of the wounded who had been sent back, numbers of whom were found dead of cold or hunger or abandoned by those charged with moving them. The road was also covered with stragglers, though on this day there was less disorder. Some of the soldiers rallied around their flags so as to share in the anticipated distributions of rations. The emperor observed this, and it gave him a momentary consolation. Late in the day, the weather became damper, and it looked like a thaw, which made the way harder for the artillery and the transports. Luckily, the frost set in again, for they would all have been bogged if the road had broken up. Meanwhile, the viceroy, marching towards Vitebsk, had close pressed by Platov and his horde of Cossacks. On the 8th, headquarters were at Bereddikino. For a moment, the emperor thought of pushing forward as far as Smolensk himself, but the surface of the snow had been first melted in the thaw and then frozen when the frost set in again, and this made the road impracticable, particularly in the dark. The fear that by leaving, he might draw swarms of stragglers after him and so cause disorder in the night at Smolensk made the emperor decide to wait till the following day, and in this he was well advised, for even those on foot were hard put to it to hold the road. Nearly everybody traveled on foot. The emperor followed the march of the guard in his carriage, accompanied by the prince of Neuchatel, but he got down two or three times a day and went on foot for a while, leaning sometimes on the prince's arm, sometimes on mine, sometimes on one of his aides de camp. The road and the strips beside it were covered with the bodies of wounded men who had died of cold and hunger and want. No field of battle ever bore so fearful an aspect. Yet, as I say, in spite of our misfortunes and these scenes of horror, the sight of the spires of Smolensk showing through the clear weather and lit with sunlight had put heart even into those most weighed down with misery. It was on the 9th, about noon, that we came once more within sight of Smolensk. The emperor, who had already arranged in advance the dispositions of troops, which the circumstances demanded, busied himself with the distribution of rations that was to be made to the army. Unfortunately, the state of the stores bore no relation to his hopes or to the general need. But so few men had rejoined their units that we were able to satisfy all who had done so. That was what really mattered. For these brave men deserved every encouragement. Their number, alas, was not very great. The governor, General Charpentier, who had known of our retreat only five days before, had done all he could to beg for the rear guard and supply their other needs. And everything had been sent to them as fast as it was made up. He had a few bakers, and the rapid movement of the army had prevented his executives, who in any case existed virtually in name alone, from making arrangements for baking advance. Thus, we could not take full advantage even of such resources as a town could have for furnished. Everyone thought of his own safety and to march as quickly as possible seemed the great secret of escaping danger. Many officers, even those of high rank, quite destitute, set an example in this general route and, leaving their units, ran by themselves to the head of the column to get something to eat. Our arrival in State Smolensk were notable for the fresh disasters which befell the emperor and the army, for one may justly call disastrous an affair which, in addition to exposing our flank, deprived us of the reinforcements of fresh troops, which should have restored the morale of our men and checked an enemy as exhausted as ourselves. The emperor must have been counting on Barrigay de Lier's corps, which, come fresh from France, he had ordered to take a position on the road to Yelnia. But the advance guard of this army occupied a weak position at Lietlachevno, under the command of General Ogaro, who had made a bad survey of his ground and worse disposition of his troops. He was surrounded on November 9th, attacked and taken prisoner. Seeing that he had put out no guards, the enemy, who had had him under observation and were also kept informed by the peasantry, took advantage of this omission. And General Ogaro, with more than 2,000 men, surrendered to an advanced guard of the Russians, of which... He should have taken more than half his prisoners, if only he had remembered the name he bore. This reverse was a disaster on more counts than one. Not only did it rob us of 
a needed reinforcement of fresh troops and of the stores collected at that point, which would have been very valuable to us. But it also encouraged the enemy, who, despite our misfortunes and the privations of our exhausted men, had suffered since leaving Moscow, were not accustomed to such successes. The officers who had been on the spot spoke very bitterly of the affair and made no excuse for the generals. As for the emperor, he laid upon this incident the responsibility for the continued retreat, which he perceived was necessary, and for the abandoning of Smolensk, where until a few days or perhaps even a few moments before, he had hoped to establish the main base of his advance guard while he was in winter quarters. From that moment, he realized the impossibility of going into quarters at Vitebsk and Orca, and he spoke of doing up to 48 hours before. He learned also that the rear guard under Marshal Ney had been hotly engaged by the Cossacks before Durogobuya. Everything seemed to fall upon the emperor at once, as though to crush him, during his halt at Smolensk. As the incidents I have just mentioned forbade his carrying out the plan of going into headquarters there, he had to recall the viceroy. He did everything possible to reorganize the different units without delaying the march of the army as a whole. Many rations were distributed and steps were taken for further distributions at Orca and the other places which the emperor thought were better stocked with provisions. He also busied himself with removing the little there was in the arsenal as though the army had not already more equipment than the teams could draw. And as though these trophies, as he called whatever we abandoned, if they were left at Smolensk, would have more value for the enemy than what we strewed every day along the roads. Clinging still to the idea that he was going into quarters, the emperor could not or would not show a trace of foresight. There is no doubt that we should have preserved much more undamaged if we had made the necessary sacrifices in time. But to two or three unfortunate horses, we allotted guns and wagons that needed six. And by not abandoning one or two guns and wagons at the proper time, we lost four or five a few days later. We planned for the day only, and because we refused as the saying is, to give the devil his due, we paid heavily in the end to the enemy. It seemed as if the emperor were expecting some miracle to alter the climate and end the ruin that was descending on us from every side. He gave his whole attention to the guard, whom he hoped to save from the general disaster because they were still holding together. One of the generals commanding the artillery of this corps made so bold one day as to suggest the sacrifice of a few guns in order not to exhaust the teams, already overdriven and reduced below the number needed. But he was not listened to. The generals and officers saw how desperate the situation was, but just as they could see no way out of it, they did nothing to preserve for a few days longer what they knew must in a few more days be lost. Speaking generally, they were so tired of war, craved so much for rest, for the sight of a less hostile country, for an end to these far-flung expeditions, that most of them let themselves be blinded as to the present fruits and future consequences of our disasters, which so they thought would prove a useful lesson to the emperor, and one that would cool his ambition. This was the common view. One can imagine the effect of that temper upon the unavoidable difficulties of our predicament and can judge how our troubles were increased by the general unwillingness to cope with them. One would have thought, from the way many officers conducted themselves, that la leçon, as they called it, could not be too severe. No one, seeing them so callous, would ever have guessed that the emperor was learning his lesson at the price of Frenchman's blood. The emperor could see our sorry plight. He was living and marching in the midst of disorder and desolation. Therefore, even the most public-spirited held themselves excused from reasoning with him or indeed from admitting the disaster was upon us. Alas, the emperor deluded himself and our ruin followed on his misfortune. The leader saw safety for the future in the very extremity of our reverses.
the emperor saw those reverses much smaller than they were. He still actually believed that he was coming to the end of his losses, that he would be able to halt and reorganize the army. This is amply proved by his fatal insistence that everything should be brought away and everything preserved, which only resulted in everything being lost. Fortune had so long showered him with favors that he could not believe she had now deserted him.